So what are we talking about? I'll, I'll make this, I'll try to keep this simple and easy and try to answer some uh, one-on-one questions, right? So what is data? Bunch of numbers, bunch of colors you see they run all the time. Uh, one definition, it's the thing that, that is found under your feet, right? So I can look at your feet and I can find some data. How much of that do we have? We have a lot of it. You have a lot of this and wherever you look, you see data, right? If you want to see that. And where does that come from? Where is data is coming from? Uh, in this case, it's coming from some special sensors that are placed under the foot. And the sensors are kind of placed 5.08 millimeters apart, right? So, and you collect some stuff from there and you have a bunch of numbers, but the data actually doesn't exist there, right? So this is your interpretation of looking at an event and you know, the way for you to talk about things. You just make the data up, it doesn't exist. And it's also incomplete because this is not only one person running and you're looking at what's happening around the midsole, it's a total situation uh, in which all the body is in motion and you're only looking at a discrete part of that. So David Bohm, a uh, renowned physicist, uh, physicist, explained this as the total significance, right? So, and the point is that we can only look at events and only capture a very small portion of that at every given time, and then we have the interpretation of that to do something. So what do we do really uh, with those things? Uh, the way in which this works is you look at the world, because it's so hard to comprehend and explain everything at once, you split it into pieces, and then you have a representation in your mind too of the, of the situation, and then you start putting stuff together to make a whole, right? So it's from the whole to parts to whole again. So this is the kind of like this analytical design process that takes place in. But as you look at what's happening, again, your attention is, you know, on the stuff that's happening. And sometimes we disregard or uh, kind of like uh, attend to some specific parts and just disregard the rest. But for designers, even the parts that you disregard may become different things, right? So that's why we have like different buildings functioning in the same ways. They, they look different. They have kind of like different sensation to us. And as the technology is changing, although this is not a new idea, we are able to put parts together in different ways. So you can blend them, actually, instead of putting and editing them. And then you, you find new methods to realize these things, right? So one is assembly. Now we are moving from assembly to different type of manufacturing in which you kind of play with materials, use one single material, but make metamaterials by changing the shape. So that's the idea of parametric design, right? So which has been influencing architecture uh, 20 years now, I would say. And interestingly, at the end of this process, you create data again, right? So you have a part with this, you, you do something with that part, you, you test it out, and you have data again. So you start with data, you end up with data again, which is a, so this becomes a language, right? Trying to understand. Uh, but as you split the world, uh, you kind of also realize this, things are not made of parts, right? A, a shoe is a kind of like, uh, part of this description too. When you put stuff on your body, it, it's, it's a whole, and you are a whole too, so you function together. <clears throat> and again, this kind of thinking, depending on if you look at the parts or not parts or the whole, changes the way in which you put, put them together. So if you Google parts for shoes, you will see these images. Obviously, they are quite different. And then if you look at the ones at the bottom, two, two of them, they are both section drawings, but if you look but if you closely look at them, the one grayscale one is more like a box cut. The other one is more uh, like a form which doesn't have clear shapes, right? So they're fundamentally different description of the same thing. Uh, and this goes back into, again, the way in which you look at the world, right? So let's say we go to the beach, we look at the grains, and we try to split the world into pieces. So if we try to sort the grains into piles of same kind, we have to come up with parameters, which is, the size of the grain, the color of the grain, the texture of the grain, but as you have those piles, then each pile will also, you will realize, will need to be sorted further more, right? So if you try to break down the world, there's no end to it. And this has been proven by Renaissance, by you know, a development of like physics and so on and so forth. You realize that the classical physics is not enough at some point, so you move to quantum physics and so on. So this, is the, this idea is actually in the book, uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Bersick, right? So he's talking about this exactly same example, and this is the parts of the landscape you're trying to understand, 
But what we start missing is you looking at the grains and sorting them, right? So you are always a part of the story. And when we start doing these technical designs, think technically, we start missing that, oh, I am the one who is thinking this way. I am the one who is sorting the grains. It, it doesn't have to be that way. So uh, we have to always remember that. So we have this knife, we split the world in an analytic way, but it's our understanding and perception uh, of the things. So in this respect, data is not uh, objective, right? So it doesn't explain things to us. It's not clearly telling what's happening. It's, it, it's helping us automating things and it's also empowering us to talk about stuff, right? So we don't have to agree about things. We may have different sorts of data. We can interpret the data in different ways, but we are able to have this conversation because there's a way to have this interpretation and capture data. And another description, right? So maybe it's not the data is not the thing that's found under your foot. It's the ink drawing created by the trees when the wind blows. So this is a work by Tim Knowles, who is an artist from UK. And what he's reporting is this is like the direct data that every tree draws. So you can see the different qualities which is the data about the branch of the tree, what it is made of and how the wind is really blowing. So this is plotted data by the tree of the event that's happening at a given moment. And this kind of understanding, it goes back to this explanation by another Tim who is an anthropologist, again from UK. Uh, he's talking, okay, we are inhabitants of the world. He's saying, no, we are not. You are the exhibitant of the world because it's a crust. And the description at the top is not the proper one because you don't live in this split world with the crust. You are with where you live in a weather world where you know the wind blows and the you know sand moves and so on, which uh, continuously can change your understanding about building dwellings, right? So you don't have you don't need the pitch roof and a box, rather you can have this wrap around yourself yourself, which fits into let's say the weather world in a better way. Right? So we, there might be more intelligent ways to understand our surroundings or you know, be more intelligent in the, in the way we process data. So talking about intelligence, uh, you know, okay, what is intelligence and what is artificial intelligence? We can maybe touch upon that a little bit. You can blame this guy a little bit. Uh, this is Alan Turing. He didn't coin the term, but his early work influenced a lot the AI studies. Uh, which AI was coined in 1956, and it's based upon the information processing model of the mind, meaning that people said, okay, the mind works with input-output sequences, and the electrical you know, machines can imitate this. So this is the idea. And we need to discuss, is it really that way or not? And the common description, if you look at the sci-fi movies, uh, might be, okay, intelligent machines that work and react like humans. Actually, that is a, some sort of AI, but it's classified a GOF AI, which is good old-fashioned AI. It's, it's the really term. It's really the term that's used for this, right? Because this is how people used to think about it. But rather, it's, if you look at the description on the other side, it's the intelligence demonstrated by machines in contrast to, to the natural intelligence displayed by humans. And that description is from Wikipedia, so it should be right. Okay, so let's see. <laughs> So, and this is called narrow AI. This is also a technical term. Uh, and this is the AI kind of AI we are using now, we are reading about uh, online. Why is this happening now? Why it has been, I mean, AI was always there, the discussion. Because we had so much data, but not enough computing, parallel computing power uh, before, now it's super accessible. So that's why we are reading so many articles for the last five years compared to what we had in the past. And if you are curious when AI will take over, there's an article on MIT Technology Review and it gives you the exact dates for that. So it says, starting from 2016, if you go, you know, let's say 80, 80 years, AI will be a researcher. You know, it's gonna do this, do that, and so on. So it's a prediction about future. Uh, the problem about predictions is uh, you will be probably wrong. So if you look at this book, if you read this book, he is talking about statistics, Nassim Taleb uh, is talking about statistics and predicting future based on evidence doesn't really work that well because if you look at the Turkey populations who are fed for a thousand days by the butcher, they always keep believing, looking at the evidence, they think that, okay, we are well fed, we are reproducing, well-being is going high, everything is amazing, but the problem is they don't know about the Thanksgiving, right, around the corner, it's coming which is a sharp cut in that graph as the population cuts down and there's no well-being anymore, right? So they don't exist. 
So the, the evidence is working to some extent, but not after a certain point. The other thing is, so you can predict future through speculation. So we saw the video at the beginning, you know, you can look at sci-fi, you can look at where the people are investing, what we are curious about, what the trends are, right? So this happened in architecture too, for like parametric design, generative design, fabrication. It affected, but also it was limited. So if you keep speculating and thinking about it, maybe you will, you know, pay attention and get more attention to the subject, this may end up being good or bad, right? So we have to also be careful about that. So if you predict, like speculate about bad stuff, like AI taking over, it may happen. So, so what? Like, so then what should we do really? Is, uh, is I put seven of them together. There might be more. So the, the data disruption is not, is not coming is not happening now, has been happening all through the time, right? So it's been going on for a couple of hundred years, actually. I'm gonna show that too. It's not new. Uh, one thing we can do is we can ask better questions first. So does AI do X better than humans? So this question, you know, is, is, has been around and I think it's, it's, a surf, it's a question that's not going that deep because we can ask, okay, can cars drive better than humans? Is, you know, a sort of question that's similar to that. The thing is, probably, if you're, if, you're, if you're trying to avoid a collision, yes, but if the car needs to make a decision at a given moment, it may be the wrong decision, right? So, it, for avoiding the collision. So, the answer, the question is, uh, cannot be that shallow, because the traffic incidents, if you ever had a traffic incident, no one can explain it. It's graded from, okay, you are guilty six out of seven. How? Like, but the guy was there and so on, so it never works, right? So, there's the context, and there's also the morality to the question. So, and how are we going to compute the context and morality in each and every case? Because there are so many unquantifiable problems, parameters that are in hand, right? So, so we should switch from this kind of questions, can X do better, can X do, you know, car drive, and so on. How can we make AI a better enabler? This is a better question for me because it's a tool and tools are enablers and so is AI, right? So we have to find a way to use this. And it has to be very context specific, right? So it has to be domain specific too. So we can ask the, another uh, commuting device, you know, is, is a bicycle, but we also have training bikes. And a self-driving training bike is totally irrelevant, right? So it can do a really good compared to you, but it's uh, out of kind of like, you know, uh, out of context. So the second thing, we can be called to driven. So we talked about this morning, we listened about like productivity, efficiency, intelligence, and so on, which are the needs about the industry for the betterment of uh, use of resources, right? Absolutely right. But then we have to look beyond that as well. So how do we define quality is very, very hard question. And then we should keep this in mind and uh, constantly uh, kind of look for the values that we can really discuss and uh, kind of bring into our designs and discussions. So what are the values then? How are we going to talk about these things? So this is an engraving by uh, Albert Breuer. He, did, he made this in 1514. And it's pretty interesting because he's depicting himself with this female angel figure. And if you look at, around the figure, you will see a lot of tools for making and measurement, right? So this is a, these are tools of Renaissance. Uh, it's, you know, the, you have the hourglass, you have the scale for morality and judgment and weight, you have the ladder to climb, you have the compass for perfect circle, you have the, you know, stone cutter, uh, ruler, hammer, and so on and so forth. And she is or he is not using them, right? Indifferent to all of them. And it's interesting, around this time he said, okay, what is beautiful? I do not know. So this is an indicator that if you have AI and if you're trying to create quote unquote beauty or quote unquote something humane, if you don't know how to do it, then the tools may become rendered useless, right? So we have to, the, the question is not in the tool, the question is in what, what your intention towards making is. Uh, so that comes, that doesn't come from AI, that comes from here, it's in your guts, right? So you have to go with your guts at times. And interestingly, so this is an article I'm not the only one saying this, I'm so lucky because I generally kind of like blame for being stick in the mud for saying these things. Uh, so if you look at this uh, article on Forbes, it's listing the skills that you will need to be successful in 2020. Where is computation? Where is, you know, like, I don't know, the, the other technical terms that you're looking for, they're not there. It's totally, it's totally the other stuff that, you know, we discuss about human qualities. 
And very interesting for designers, if you look at number one, two, three, and 10, these are about ambiguity, right? So it's not about clarifying the world and having the symbolic representation of everything. It's rather preserving ambiguity and using it, the stuff that we don't know. And ambiguity goes back to, this is a book from 30 years ago, 40 years ago. It's talking about what computers still cannot do at that time, right? And computers still cannot do these things by Dreyfus. Because potentially, and actually, the, the, uh, the model of the mind uh, as a symbolic representation or information processing model of the mind is not accurate. Here we go, ambiguity. So this is one of them. Is it, you know, you can switch back and forth forever. This is a well-known, uh, you know, illustration or a question by Jastrow. So you can look at this and, okay, duck rabbit, duck rabbit. But the, what I'm trying to say here is it's actually a crocodile, right? So, so this is exactly my, you know, uh, the, the, the understanding or my visual perception, which is working with ambiguity. I'm sure if we sit together, we can find a zoo in there, okay, all the animals. And uh, the other thing is you need to be agile, right? So the, the, everything is changing so fast. And uh, in architecture too, so some of the uh, projects we saw today, we have this discussion has been going on forever and it's gonna keep going too. But industry and making the ways in which we do things is changing too. So I will give you one, for instance, one design method we, uh, uh, we are looking at now and it has been in place is designed for additive manufacturing, right? So. This is uh, looking into 3D printers, becoming trans actually transforming into manufacturing machines from prototyping machines. And architecture will use this too. It's just gonna take time. It's an issue of scaling, right? Uh, but this is one area I think it's gonna be, become very interesting because it will make you discover new materials. It will make you discover new printing curing systems and testing systems, right? So all of these are happening now in the footwear industry and it's gonna be happening in the architecture. Very small note, it's pretty interesting. For parametrics, architecture was faster taking on the, you know, the, the role of using the parametric design. Uh, footwear is now faster in the material side because it's more accessible and easier, right? So we have to kind of like discuss that equation and see how architecture can catch up. Uh, Fifth one, everything will be automated so you will have so much free time. This is true. It doesn't matter if you lose your job or not. Uh, you know. <clears throat> the question is, what do you do at that free time? Well, there are so many you know, streaming services, that's one of them, you can just be stationary and just watch, right? Or the other thing is you can contribute because we are humans, we can create a lot of value. This is 5.5, I'm sorry, I have to squeeze this in. So, to use that time, you have to find an inexhaustible question, right? So having that question will help you move forward in these this kind of like uh, areas. So my question for my PhD was, okay, how, how do I combine humanly analog ways of making with pure computation, right? How can I talk about making drawings, ink drawings, but also explain them as ways of computing so the machines can become more humane, right? So this is... They're not coming yet, but this is a way to kind of have those kind of discussions. And then, you know, also like doing the oil paint things, saying, okay, how can I really have this conversation and make, make start building some bridges uh, between computing and being human? The other thing is, okay, I need resources, I need to, you know, learn more and so on and so forth. We can always expect the other ones to give us those resources. So I think this event is one of them but I think we have to do it ourselves too. And this is usually coming from empowering the others, right? So I'm bringing this discussion so you can question me hopefully in the next session and you know, so I can, I can get better with my question next time. Uh, but just an example for that is, as a former architect uh, and new, kind of like new to the footwear design uh, and also questioning this uh, computation parts and holes discussion, I wanted to bring that discussion to uh, to MIT as a, back to MIT as a workshop. And I offered this workshop called uh, Shoe as a Field. Uh, it turned out to be really nice. All the images uh, we, we see here are produced by students. Uh, so I said, okay, I'm gonna take 10 students. We had 33 applicants, so I picked 14 of them. 
and 11 of them survived, right? So three of them are like, I can't take this anymore. Uh, but what we did is uh, we, we prepared a bunch of files for the students and they were almost 60% there, right? So because this is a three-day workshop, if I walked in by, you know, I'm gonna teach hard skills and so on, it wouldn't happen. So this is like a lot of em empowerment so they can kind of finish the project and get compelling, uh, uh, <clears throat> let's say, projects and all, at the same time be convincing in the way they are proposing uh, some, uh, let's say, you know, future-looking uh, ways of manufacturing, but at the same time, you know, a little bit uh, poking our visual thinking and uh, being speculative in the space. And also in turn, so this is, uh, you know, a project by a student, this is what I did during, while teaching them. It just happened to emerge as I was having this conversation with them. Okay, so how does this relate to this event, right? So this is the this is the page web page for this event. I just took that first paragraph, and I tried to okay. Am I am I really kind of like answering these questions? And I tried to. So okay, data is being collected. Yes, because somebody thought it's worth collecting, uh, right? Uh, that's one of the things, and this is one of the from one of the talks that I heard recently. But there is a lot of bias in the way in which we collect the uh, data around us. Technology-driven achievements, it's great because technology is an enable, enabler and it will always be, right? So we have to, we live with it, so there's no, no point of denying. A data-driven mindset is interesting, so I would replace that with a quality-driven mindset because I try to call, talk about quality, and if you are interested in quality, we really look at the Robert Persig's book, uh, Zen and the Motorcycle Maintenance. Uh, we need a quality-driven mindset that's supported with data. I think that's a better solution. And quantifying the value of good design is very, very, very hard uh, because I was trying to, at some point, measure the, you know, which picture is good to use, you know, like using some computational techniques. I think it's pretty, pretty hard, but we don't have to. We don't have to really quantify some of the values because we can't, but we can always find ways to produce better designs by using data. So that's the, uh, that's the way, I think. Okay, will AI add value or replace you? So this is the question. So Phil was kind of, uh, you know, mentioning about this in a conversation. So if it is replacing you, you will need to find another job, okay? If it is not replacing you, actually you will find another job anyway because, <laughs> because it's gonna change. Things are gonna change. That's what Erlene was pointing out, that Shane was pointing out too. So we have been having these discussions again with five, 15 years with some of the friends I have here. And uh, it's gonna keep changing, right? So this, we cannot really freeze the time. So if you look at these two propositions of value add or like work replacement, it's not gonna work versus, it's gonna, it's gonna happen together. So, you know, I'm done, I don't want to go into too much detail, but we had horses, not so much because we have cars, you know, horses were replaced by, you know, engines and blah. It's a very simple idea, right? So it's going to happen. Anything that's, that can be automated, Starbucks design, will definitely be automated, right? And I think there's an opportunity. Uh, like, you can, you can find better values, better jobs, better things about being human and producing. And we have to do it together, right? So the, if you wait someone to come and tell you, okay, this is the next year, this is the next thing you will do, it's gonna be a problem, okay? There will be the jobs and you will lose your job and it's gonna be hard, right? But if we try to figure it out for everyone, I think it's gonna be pretty empowering. So if you don't figure it out for everyone, no one will do it for us. This is, this is one note that I would like to give. And that's the seventh one, which is you have to be the driving force. As the designers, I think designers are important people because we are able to combine a lot of understandings from very different disciplines, merge them, funnel them into the future of AI, future of technology, and how these things are being utilized and used. Thank you very much.